Frost is a label owner, collector, and philanthropist, an attorney. <laughs> Aww. He's one of the good ones. Don't right, say that so when you need me. <laughs> a BA in theater, not shocking. An MA in American Studies and a JD. Childhood thrifty excursions with his grandmother in Buffalo sparked his interest in the esoteric and exotic. He lives with Waitali, their dog in San Diego, and Joshua Tree. Skip Heller is active in many different types of music as performer, producer, and historian. Skip studied with Robert Dresden and played with Ema Sumac. Ow. Indeed, or Amy Camus, as some might call her. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Among many others, he is currently the leader of the Film Noir Orchestra and the Voodoo Five. I'm pleased to introduce both Chris J. Krauss Esquire and Skip Heller. I actually held Ema Sumac's passport. There's no Amy anywhere on there. <laughs> Did you guys hear me? Yeah. All right, awesome. Skip is the preeminent expert at this, so my job is just to corral him going today. And my job is just to keep the bar low on what constitutes expertise. <laughs> Play whatever you want. First slide. Anybody know who these guys are? Who's this guy? Are we going to talk about them today? No! <laughs> Why not? Because the other guys! <laughs> we talked about them way too much. Right? Yes. Well, you're here to learn about everybody but them. Yeah. Right? <laughs> All right, next slide. You guys know who this is? Yeah. yeah. William Kennedy Ellington, a.k.a. Duke. Yeah. Um, Arguably, the, the great American composer from 1930 until his death in 1973. But he was also very concerned with the music of the world. And if you look at pictures of Duke Ellington in like 1939, you'll see his drummer, Sonny Greer, has like gongs and temple blocks and all kinds of exotic percussion. And in 1967, he finally got around to, to dedicating an entire, oh, lest I forget, he also wrote the first American national anthem of Exotica, which is Caravan, which we'll be visiting later. I'm sure you all know it. Sing along, it's our comeback. <laughs> um, then in 1967, he made a record called The Far East Suite, that each song was named after another region. And I think we should play a little bit of uh, Agra. Video or audio? No, there's just audio of Agra. It's audio. Opera. So, Skip and I have a thesis that we share, that there are no exotica bands or exotica artists, there's just exotica records. So we're going to talk about exotica records. So there might be some artists that you see up here that you say, they're jazz, they're this, they're that. These are exotica records, and that's where exotica really comes from. And this is Ellington. No, that's Art Blakey. <laughs> Lee, DJ Lee Joseph, everybody. And this is Tally. Oh! Lola's mom and Lucas stop mom. No. By the way, I, I just wanted to give my thesis because people say, well, what is Exotica? And Exotica is the national music of a fictional country. It does not exist, and it's basically made up by combining different music from different places that don't necessarily have any contact with each other. So especially in Les Baxter's music, you hear a lot of Cuban influence. We're not talking Cuban. about Les Baxter. <laughs> in Robert Dresden's music, we hear a lot of... Listen why I'm here, keep them focused. In Robert Dresden's music, in, in the body politic of Exotica, 
you hear a lot of Latin percussion combined with a lot of French classical music influence. And these regions don't really reach each other too much. And a lot of time, you're supposed to hear something that sounds dark continent or south seas. And then you hear a lot of instruments made out of metal, literally, vibraphone, whatever. But these regions don't produce anything made out of metal. So again, it's a completely fictional conceit. As fictional as Charlton Heston being Moses. <laughs> it's speaking, but, speaking of Latin percussion, Cal Jader. And Cal Jader, through his career, flirted with exotic influences, but he was also one of the first guys to get into a lot of the Cuban stuff. And we have some video of him. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. Okay, next slide after that. Yeah. Like, yeah, here we go. And it's the same tune. Can you guys see that okay? It's a little blurry. Right? It's a little pixelated, but trust me, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, I don't even call it Joey, so. We did not put that down. So. same um, instrumentation that we affiliate with He Who Shall Remain Nameless, which in this case is Mark Denner. It's, it's the same format. Um, what time the, is it? We've been doing this five minutes. And, and I've already broken the rules twice. <laughs> I'm a loner, Donnie. Okay. One more time and I'm going to invite one of you folks up here to take over. But the thing that Cal Jader's groups had more than a lot of the Hollywood groups is those of you who know the stuff are going to go like, hey, that guy playing Kogan is Pancho Sanchez. And in short, his groups grooved harder than what we typically think of as the Exotica groups. But he made a lot of records that have that, like, let's reach for the Far East. You know, that Franz Prado. Yes. Who brought Franz Prado to the United States? Does anybody have that answer? Because I, I have I have a gift for you if you know. Who brought him to the United States? <laughs> Dizzy Gillespie was the guy responsible for him. Did, but Dizzy was like, oh, we'll get to him, and he was a one-man international. So, oh, you guys know who John Burks Gillespie is? Dizzy Gillespie? That's why we all wear berets and horn glasses. Tell us about Fred. Cuban percussion. Okay, so Chris Parado was one of the was one of the first guys to come here and get a, a deal on a major record label. That's one thing. That's why you can find his records in thrift stores everywhere where Latin dancing was anything. It was very widespread. And if we go a couple up, he, he did these, the Voodoo Suite and the Exotic Suite, which were definitely him putting his hand to Exotica. But if we go to the next slide, we have video. And this is another advantage to Press Parado being on a major label. We actually get to see film footage of him. Look at that. Came through the jazz festivals. 
from all the greats up to Wynton Marcellus, Harris Blanchard, Donald Harrison, the, the titans of today. Yeah, and I mean, the guy was, he also had a really outsized interest in Cuban percussion. And uh, he made several albums that were just really percussion showcases. And he worked with a lot of Cuban guys who really brought the old Yoruba traditions into what they were doing. I mean, these are not jazz records. These are really... I was just going to say, if this is a jazz artist, but would you buy this record thinking it was jazz? Exactly. There's no exotic artist. There's exotic records. Next slide. Chico Hamilton. He's sort of like Art Blakely, but on the West Coast. Everybody from the West Coast went through him. He was also the hero of my hero, Charlie Watts. And it, by the way, when you're in thrift stores, a good thing to look for on an album cover is a gong. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if it's somebody who looks really American. Next slide. John Burke Scholesky, Dizzy. Dizzy is important because he's, he, he brings, like Art Blakey was the drummer in his big band. Chano Pozo, who was the, the first of the really great Cuban conga players, is playing conga in his band. And Diz has an outside influence in Cuban music. Not least of all because when he was in Cap Calloway's band, he was the second trumpet player to a guy named Mario Bauza. And Mario Bauza is to, is to Cuban music what Bill Monroe is to bluegrass music, what Muddy Waters is to electric blues. And he's the template. Everything that comes after him is a result of him. And Dizzy took this very seriously. And then when Dizzy started traveling internationally, he brought a lot of incredible people. So the guy who wrote Gillespieana is a guy named Lalo Schifrin. Who knows that name? Okay, for those of you who don't know that name, see if you can identify Dunk, 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 dunk. And the theme is Mission Impossible. Yeah. <laughs> Lalo Schifrin is one of the most sampled artists of 90s and 2000s hip hop. And uh, what people don't know about Lalo Schifrin is he was a great enough piano player to just do that, but luckily for us, he composed. So we're gonna watch Dizzy playing some of this. And as you can hear, those of you who know the Cuban stuff, they're doing the a Cuban 12 hill. So a guy from Philadelphia playing on top of this Yoruba Cuban rhythm on music written by a Brazilian. That's exotic. He's good. <laughs> Who knows who Sunrise? Yeah. From Chicago, and then he went to Philadelphia, Skip's hometown. I actually used South to live around the corner from him. And uh, in the summer, I, I would climb up onto the roof of where I lived and I might or might not have been smoking something uh, that young people at the time were very much into. It was the 80s. Think the Oasis young. is a family business? <laughs> I'm talking about my former life. But I would sit on the roof and listen to those guys rehearse. They would just rehearse piles of music. They were like a cult. Yeah, they and really you, were. They, you worked like 24 hours a day and you had to like be rescued to get out of it. Like, literally, like, like if you wanted to leave, you could have. Yeah, there's no red meat, no tobacco, no alcohol. So you would see these guys sneak around the corner from Morton Street, because Sonny didn't really leave the house very much, and they'd be smoking little Dutch Master cigars and drinking little airport bottles of uh, Jack Daniels. <laughs> Catherine Dunham is an interesting lady. She was a dancer and an academic, and she was a mixed race. European and Black American, and she actually traveled the Caribbean in search of dancing and music, and it's, she did a ton of field work and field recording, and she put out a series of records that are total exotica, but these are actual people playing 
this stuff. She did that, my Adira did it, and we're gonna get to another person that's very important to skip in a second, who did that as well. Next slide. Uh, Elizabeth Waldo, who is, I think, 106 years old right now. Yeah, give it up to Elizabeth. Just let her feel like her Because she's probably sitting in bed reading the LA Times Sunday paper right now. That's what she does. And uh, we visited her last year, my wife to be and I. Um, I wasn't invited, so. No, Mar it was it was us and Marty Lush and uh, Marty gets the comment. Yeah. Well, Marty lived up the street. She lives in the San Fernando Valley. And, and we, we have some video, so when Spice yeah. Gibbs talk, we're going to cue the video. Yeah, cue the video. So, in the 1930s, she was at the Curtis Institute of Music, at, at the time when Leopold Stokowski was the guy literally running orchestral music in the world. That's exactly, he was so famous there could be a Bugs Bunny cartoon about him. And he discovered her playing violin and brought her into his youth orchestra. And she went to South America and fell in love with ancient music and ancient instruments and started writing things in this style and continued to make two albums for the GNP label. Lee, why don't you hold up your, your 45 with balsa boat? Oh. Go get it. <laughs> But we just saw her last year, and, and Lena sang for her, and she said, oh my, I, I must use her. Uh, she has exactly the right tone. In the 60s, uh, she went on tour as Ema Sumac's concertmaster, and we compared Ema Sumac stories from being on tour, and they were the same in the 60s as they were in the 90s. But as you can see, like, this is, uh, you know. Does anybody know what that is? It appears to be some sort of bassoon. Like it's a Chinese wind instrument. Because uh, she was really, after she had sort of um, collected all of these South American percussion instruments, she started to get interested in Urdu and different Chinese instruments. Thurston Knudsen, and this is the start of a bunch of guys who had real jobs. They scored music for television and movies. Probably movies that you've seen a million times these guys did the music for. They also put out albums in their spare time. And he's one of them. And he did a series of these percussion albums. Excellent. This is one you probably saw. And as Skip said, anytime you see somebody with a gong on an album, anytime you see the words percussion by cha-cha-cha, bongos, Stereo. <laughs> no, that, that was like a big oh, thing. <laughs> and anytime you see stereo and percussion on the album cover, what they always do is, does anybody know what panning is? Yeah. Okay, so panning is the, the placement in left to right. Uh, so, you, so basically when you close your eyes, you feel like you're in front of a band. Um, that's why, like if you have a James Taylor album, for instance, uh, James is always in the middle with his guitar and then things fan out. Well, with these provocative percussion albums, and that could be a whole seminar, there's nothing in the center. Everything is like all over the place and really weird. You can get vertigo if you listen while you're walking up steps. <laughs> Chano, I actually saw this record at the Swap Meet the other day, and the guy wanted like $250 for it. Yeah, so even crazier actually, is he paid that. No. <laughs> He was actually an American named Leon Johnson. But he, he made all these records that were like sort of fake jungle records. And a guy named Leon, who was a black American pretending to be African, that's exotic. Sort of like a black American pretending to be Indian who we will not be talking about today. Notice how I didn't say the name. Yes, he shall remain nameless. This is probably his most popular record. Anytime you see jungle on a record, what do you do? <laughs> Anytime you see African percussion safari, what do you do? And this one was on a label called a mega tape, and everything they put out was in stereo. So what do you do? <laughs> Mr. Bongo, not to be confused with Jack Bongo Burger or Preston Bongo Epps. <laughs> Jack Costanzo. Uh, do we, is this where our video of Jack is placed? 
Uh, I believe so. Next okay. slide. Okay, next slide. And when you see a naked woman playing a bongo, what do you do? Wild rhythms. Lad and fever. These are no brainers, folks. And these, I should mention, these are all records from our collection. All right, okay. Who, who can tell us who this is? Okay, now we were saying Caravan is the national anthem of um, Exotica. Here's Jack Costanza. We actually have video of him with Bronte Soul who wrote Caravan with Duke Ellington who put his name on Caravan. And Nat King Cole is going to take a piano solo that's going to break your brain. Notice how he's in the camera with the so The mystery of their fading light that shines upon our caravan. Also, you'll notice like Jack Costanzo is using his fingertips a lot. This technique is really super good. Not like this, right? Not like the hippies and OCDs, right? Or or even <laughs> not like Mongo Santa Maria who looks like he's hitting with baseball balls. So, oh well, that was short, but. Who knows who George Cates played with? All right, no, no, no. no. <laughs> yes, and you get, if I can get it out of my pocket. I just put it in there before I came up, so don't, don't think. It's, it's been in there all day. <laughs> you get the new Voodoo 5 record featuring Lena Marie Cardinal. Yeah. If you enjoy it, put it on Instagram and tag all of us. And please come see Voodoo 5 tonight at 8 o'clock at the Sands. Yeah. All at of 9 o'clock at room 5211. Come hear the voice that, that no less than Elizabeth Waldo said had the right tone. Oh. What's your name? Dave. Dave. Everybody give it a Dave around the clock. Dave. 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 Why? Polynesian percussion, right? Yeah. Sensational stereo percussion. Next up. Did you know it was Lawrence Welk or you just read it? No, I didn't know that. Okay. And then we have a video here. Well, here, let's uh, preview this a little bit, which is, that's Alvino Ray. And he's the guy who plays Steel on a lot of the, sorry, I have to say the name, Esquivel Records. That's three times, who wants to take his <laughs> But to his credit, he's only mentioned Martin Denny once, Esquivel once, and West Texas. So, one of the things that Lawrence Welk did was he would have these different guitar players do these kind of feature things. Alvino Ray was the first, and George Cates uses Alvino Ray a lot. And that is Peanuts Huckle, great clarinet player, but not very exotic. Hence the name Peanuts. Oh, but also, Buddy Merrill would, would do these uh, steel guitar features on um, on the Lawrence Welk show, and they were always kind of really sort of space agey. And tonight, on the Voodoo Five stage, will be Buddy Merrill's actual steel guitar in the service of our men. Now, this one takes a little bit of. Everybody, sing this bass line. If you So, if you turn it upside down, you get a, compliment, uh, a composition that I will not name by a composer who will remain nameless, who also, on his first recording under his own name, recorded this song. And as you can tell, this is a Disney cartoon. And Disney, every exotic artist recorded this song. Every, like, unless they were composing all their own stuff, Bahia is in there. And it came from this Disney cartoon because in the 1938 to 1938 World's Fair, Disney fell in love with Brazilian music. And this might be the first commercial move towards Exotica because, yeah, that, you know, how authentic to Brazil is Walt Disney. And as we also know, Walt Disney wasn't very predisposed to people of color. Uh, the first Disney animator of color is like in the early 60s, I think. So this is where things overlap with the Tiki Oasis theme for this summer. Western, we have some country guitar players who 
you don't necessarily associate country music with exotica, right? But if you buy old country records like I do, sometimes there's a whole side of exotica music. But there's always at least one song on those albums where there's like an exotica freak out. And you're like, oh my God, and you call Skip up, you play it for him over the phone, and he says, I'm buying this immediately. <laughs> True. <laughs> Or you're sitting along waiting for your wife and girlfriend last night at 1 o'clock in the morning and you start playing the YouTube videos of stuff like this and he's like, ah, this guy's fine. Yeah. No, the, the thing is, the Hawaiian guitar is the precursor to the modern pedal steel guitar. So even Jimmy Rogers is the first, he's like the Garth Brooks of 1932, except talented. And there are, there are Hawaiian... That's why he's here. The most out Garth Brooks. But the, the Hawaiian guitar is the first sort of um, steel guitar to make it into country music. And then in Texas, the Western swing guys start adopting it because frankly, it's electric and you can hear it over the sound of people dancing, which anybody who saw Big Sandy in the mid nineties heard them getting drowned out by people dancing. So a guy named Bob Dunn, is playing with Milton Brown in his musical Brownies, and that becomes an influence on Bob Wills. And since they have the pedal steel guitar, and Hawaiian music is starting to come to the fore, Hawaiian music gets a foothold in country music, and then finally it gets to the point where Elvis makes two movies in Hawaii, one crappy, one semi-crappy. <laughs> but both of which have great songs with great steel guitar stuff. And if you don't notice, the Hawaiian guitar was the most popular instrument in the world in from like 1890s to, to the Depression. There was actually door-to-door -door salesmen who would go and sell correspondence courses. And you can still find the books, which I actually did today in the marketplace, of Hawaiian guitar courses. So if you want to hear more about this, I did pitch Otto on country music for your tiki bar. So if you're interested in hearing more about that, possibly this summer, email him and say you would buy tickets. Because we can go a little harder than just Joey. <laughs> Jerry Bird, country guitar player doing Exotica. Once again, no exotic artists, only Exotica records. And here's another one that's even more exotic. We have a pretty naked lady there, Polynesian Sweet. Billy Murr, another kind of an offshoot of Les Paul, because nothing says exotica like let's exploit some stuff that is going on in the marketplace. So Billy Murr, as we can tell, we have something called Pink Hawaii, and it's, this is actually a really cool record, but it's also a lot of really adventurous guitar stuff. You went through all the colors. Yeah. And, uh, there's also uh, the supersonic, and anything that says supersonic is where the Buddy Merrill, again, this actual pedal steel guitar will be on stage tonight in the sands. You can touch it. Don't you can. Put your hands on it. You we'll have sanitizer. <laughs> and, uh, but it's not just, it's the combination of like Les Paul sort of cosmic super echo stuff and Hawaiian stuff and some bongos, but you always gotta have some bongos. Who knows who these guys are? And how often do you find their records? Oh, you ever see this one? Yes. You do? Yes. No. This one is hard to find. Yeah, there's, there's two good ones. This is like a $30 record. But the, <laughs> oh, you got lucky. <laughs> but there's, there's you this one. you see the ones where they have the mutton chops? And yeah. All yeah, you don't want to get the, the mutton chop ones are a bad deal. You don't want the mutton chop ones. <laughs> but you want this one or the one where they're in these sort of uh, Doris Wishman nice nude on the moon space This ones. one. <laughs> last up. Yeah. They were a piano duel, duel right? Like, oh, and like piano. Elizabeth Waldo, they came out of the Curtis Institute of Music, although they were a little later on. And the first two albums, the ones that are like cosmically weird, have what they call treated piano, which is where you take objects and put them on the strings of the piano on the side. Who started these guys, Torrent and Alexander? They are the Ferrani and Teicher of the organ. Yeah, so if you can find their records, Go buy them. And Josh, are you impressed by that one? Do you know who these guys are? 
All right. So I saw Josh like two days ago. He's like, and I can't do impersonations because I'm Italian from New York, so I only have one one level of speaking. But he, you know, imagine I'm Josh. He's like, I'm coming to your seminar. You're better impressed. <laughs> That's exactly what you said, right? He's in the jokes. <laughs> I wish I could do impersonations because I have so many spent jokes, but they don't they don't translate with my accent. <laughs> That's not tiki. <laughs> Impressions are not tiki. Too Jewish. Now you don't know what this record's about, but would you buy it? Yes. <laughs> and luckily for us all, I found one for a dollar. I, I, I found this record, um, the way other people are about the Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass Whipped Cream and Other Delights record. When I was about 13 years old, this was my Whipped Cream and Other Delights. <laughs> and you wonder why, right? <laughs> Which is amazing, because I actually hate swimming and am petrified of the water. But Leo Diamond wrote one of the first sort of like specific to Exotica songs, because as I said, we have Taboo, Moon Over Night Core and all that. But he was a virtuoso harmonica player, and he wrote Offshore, which all the people we can't name recorded at some point. And hey David, what record is Offshore on? Right. What record is Offshore on? The record I just gave you? Oh, no. You don't even look at it? Right. And our version was actually kind of based a little more on Santo and John's. You don't even look at it. Oh, come on. <laughs> this guy was... He invented like electric harmonicas and developed an early bass harmonica. He's buried in, uh, he's buried about 75 feet from Ema Sumac at Hollywood Forever Cemetery. So if you ever wanted a, a dead exotica day, Hollywood Forever. <laughs> Coming soon, skips that exotica legends tour. <laughs> 99.95, payable to me. My rabbi and my manager, folks. <laughs> When I was a kid, I was obsessed with Barry White. You guys remember Barry White? Yeah. So if you read the old Barry White liner notes, it said spiritual advisor Larry Newman's. So my goal was always to be a spiritual advisor on an album. And I put out a ton of albums and nobody's actually allowed me to be their spiritual advisor. <laughs> Until now. <laughs> Shalom. No, Tommy Morgan, does anybody know who Tommy Morgan is? Yes, you do. Every Not time. David. He's already he's yeah. already won yeah. one to you. You uh, everybody here has heard Tommy Morgan if you've watched anything with a harmonica in it made in Hollywood after 1958. Gunsmoke, Blazing Saddles, Twilight Zone, Pet Sounds, Beach Boys. Um, he's just he's everywhere. Uh, and he's actually on Robert Dresden's Voodoo 3, which was like he, he, I'm watching him go up. We're gonna get to that. Yeah, but I was, before we get to that, I just want to say, I watch him go up to the mic, and I hear one note, and I go, "Oh my God, it's him!" <laughs> like as identifiable as Herb Alpert. It was just amazing. So, Th this is a fella. This record is somewhat hard to find. I have no idea who John McFarlane is. You you Google John McFarlane, all these other people come up. It's actually John Leslie McFarlane. And he was one of those TV guys. There's not a whole lot out there about him. There's some videos that people uploaded of them, you know, with the tracks refurbished. There's not any real live performances, and there's not a whole lot of information about him. But, you know, it's got a tiki mask and a gal with really yeah. red lipstick and uh, a very Arabian looking script. And I say it's an exotic guy. And it's, not just, and it's not just exotic, it's exotic motifs. Right. And he's got this Man Ray type photo here. Yeah, you would buy that, right? Yeah. Would you you had me in Man Ray. Would you spend thirty dollars on it? You should. <laughs> Next slide. Would you spend thirty dollars on this record? Yeah. yeah. I have this And how yeah. much did you pay for it? Uh, five dollars. Oh, you guys get lucky. This is like a fifty dollar record. Well, it's a $50 record in stereo. If you get it in mono, a little less, but 
It's recorded in 35 millimeter film, Hell. stereo, and it's got that shit on it. So it's, <laughs> you need this record. When you, when, when you cannot pronounce the name of the artist, that's usually a good sign too. Also, it's, um, it's on Cameo Records, which is the same label that brought you The Twist. Tommy Jagger. Cameo Parkway, Philadelphia label, mostly funded by payola and gangsters. So this record I found at an antique store, and I, it didn't have a price on it, and I went up to the counter, and the woman says, I have to call the guy, and, she, and he says, over the phone, that's an expensive record. And I go, no it's not. And he calls back five minutes later, and I got this for 10 bucks. Does anybody have this one? Yeah. So, so what we can't really illustrate here is it's a silver foil cover with red letters, uh, a mixed race woman of some sort with really bitchin' eye makeup, exotic and some love tiki stuff. Ritual. <coughs> so, you need to know more than an exotic love yeah. ritual? <laughs> yeah, usually if it's on Columbia, it's not a good bet, but this is the exception that proves it. And it's not a how-to manual. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got the water? Next slide. Felix Slacking, he's one of these guys that's like the epitome of easy listening, and he put out tons of records. You can find his records everywhere. This is probably the best one. Yeah, every everybody who had strings, whether it was 101, the Fantastic Strings, the Klebanoff Strings, there's always one exotic record. And frankly, uh, if you see it's on Liberty or a hi-fi label, definitely get it because the recordings are usually wonderful. I have no joke. <laughs> Stanley Wilson? Do you need any more information yeah. other than David Bob and some woman who looks like she's being chased by Bigfoot? And, and high fidelity. It's got five instruments. And you know, it's got the titles Music for a Bat, Cylon. A love dance? Anytime you see a love dance of any kind. Tarkana love dance? Grass skirt proposal? Unless it's, unless it's Delaware love dance, it's gonna be exotic. Who has this right? I wish. How much did you pay for that? Like not not five dollars. Oh my god. We need we need to kidnap you and follow you around. <laughs> Next slide. Who knows who this guy is? Nobody? So, yeah, 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 you win yourself a Voodoo 5 CD. What, he, he was the arranger for Sinatra in the 40s, right? Yeah. And then who did he work with after Sinatra dumped him? Bing Crosby. No. And I can't get the CD out of my pockets. So <laughs> <laughs> What's your name, bro? Scott. Scott, everybody give it up to Scott. <laughs> Scordal was Scordal actually recorded to arrange for Sinatra again in the '50s on the Point of No Return album, which has a great-looking purple cover where Frank looks very, you know, like Ava Gardner's ghost is still chasing him, and he's just one of the most beautiful string arrangers ever. Totally worth it. It's got a it's got a really nice jade green cover and a bird of some sort, and all that jewelry, and all that jewelry. So. No, that's a frog. That's a frog. You get your mind out the gutter. So, I bought- you just, you just recommended something with something on it called Love Dance and you're telling people to get their mind out of the gutter? Hey, I'm a conundrum, man. It's a how-to It doesn't make sense. So I bought this record. I played over the phone for Skip. Skip's like, I have to get this. I played over the phone for Jeff Chanel. Jeff Chanel's like, I have to get this. I played for Otto. He's like, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. Who has this record? No, not even David. No. No. The, here, here's the thing. Like in general, if you see a record is on the Jubilee label, if it's cheap, just buy it because they usually have interesting covers. And there's a lot of good records on Jubilee. There's a lot of shitty records on Jubilee, but if it even looks halfway interesting, it probably is. And it has the words jungle. And then fantastic, not fantastic. And there's another bird. It's perfect. <laughs> we should make like Chris and Skip's lists. Birds, <laughs> word covers. Yeah, something the size of like a Brunch. credit card. Oh, it has that? <laughs> yeah, we should do that. We should charge $9.99 for that. 
Skip, Skip and Chris says, buy these words. <laughs> yeah, well, I can do that. Look, it's got a boy on it. It's got hey, a yeah, 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 yeah. Get it off, All right? I was talking about my friend Lead Pipe Joe the other day. <laughs> no, seriously, I know a guy named Lead Pipe Joe. And so he's also, also and, and, you know, I'm only actually one quarter Italian and three quarters Jewish. He's three quarters Italian and one quarter Jewish. And his uncle, Joe Bruno. Uh, Joe, Joe Bruno is the first cousin of Angelo Bruno, who... Do you ever see the movie The Irishman? Harvey Keitel, Angelo Bruno? I have another so, friend who was no, played no by Ray Wilson. The audience. So. <laughs> oh, no, oh, call, call Uncle Joe. <laughs> Next slide. All right, who has this one? And oh, it's, you're the only one. <laughs> Would you buy this record? Yes. Volcano. Always buy a volcano. Yes. Always buy a volcano. Always buy forbidden. Exciting sound. And here's another thing: if it's on Crown, always buy it because. If it's not if it's not what you think it is, it's usually going to be a good '50s rhythm and blues record because they had a hookup with a label called Modern, so you get a lot of like good, what they you know like strip sounding music, uh, a lot of you know. It's not rock and It looks like a rock and label. No, it's um, there's a uh, Richard Berry, Johnny Guitar Watson, Joe Houston. A lot of people you should know about. Who has this record? And don't tell me you bought it for two dollars. Yeah, 1964. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who has this record? Scott. Scott, how much did you pay for that record? <laughs> this is literally like a $200 record. And look, it says stereophonic sound, not just stereo, stereophonic sound, white goddess. And an out of a blurry, out of focus, naked woman behind some grass of some sort. She's the woman that the other woman was running from, right? <laughs> that would explain. It. All right, this is a record that I bought just for the hell of it. I didn't listen to it for months. I put it on, and I immediately call Skip, and I hold the, the phone to it. The Skip, I, it doesn't respond until like three minutes later, and then he's like, I just bought it. <laughs> and then it comes about two days later, and Lena's walking by on her way into the bedroom to feed the cat, because we feed the cat wherever he sits. And uh, she goes, who is that? And to get a who is that out of like, maybe the greatest living exotica singer. Definitely the greatest living exotica singer. Um, tell, tell us what it sounds like. It's like, and we don't have we don't have any information on this one. Yeah, we we know oh, nothing. We don't know you know, nothing. A lot of times it can be harder to find out information about the singers because sometimes they're not in the union, and it's even worse with female singers because often enough it's a stage name or a maiden name. Uh, so we we've lost track of a certain amount of people who we were looking for. But this is sort of like very wordless Ema Sumaki over an orchestral backing that reminds me very much of the kind of thing that Leonard Bernstein was writing on his way to West Side Story. And it's just fantastic, like, the only thing I can kind of compare it to is, um, does anybody know City of Glass by Bill Gravinger with Stan Kenton? Yeah. Okay, it's, it's that otherworldly, it's just absolutely brilliant. And again, it's on Columbia, which is usually a turnoff, because, um, Columbia didn't really, they didn't really traffic in this kind of music too much. But every now and then, they hit one out of the park. So if you see this record anywhere, um, thank Chris, because I wouldn't know about it to tell you about it, except that he buys everything and actually listens to it. Anything on the adventures and sound on Columbia is fine. And Phil Moore was the guy who produced this. Yeah. And Phil Moore uh, was this this black gentleman who was just basically a piano player. And he played in bars with Bobby Shore and other folks, and he did a bunch of records. But and his, he got some composition training somewhere, because th this stuff is pretty advanced. And that's like, there's a lot to love about it. 
Would you buy this record? Yes. And what would you think it is? Would you think it's like some combative drum scene or something like that? What would you what would you think that is? You got this like goddess, you got this uh, the, the mountain, and then the, the, the band's name is in French. Well, that could be Tahitian. That's what? Same band. You see this, what do you think? No, ska, right? You think they're a ska band, right? Right? You know, they're the specials or something. But then we have to start Watusi Warrior, Brazil, which is another one of those tunes that, you know, American Exotica folks These love. These guys are Brazil. total Exotica. Total Exotica, and they're from Chicago? Uh, Kansas City. So Kansas City. Imagine the 60s Ramsey Lewis group going exotic, and that's about what this is. Great. Would you buy this record? <laughs> Flip it over. This is the back of that record. And this is pretty much all we know about these guys. It's like music for a Chinese restaurant, right? <laughs> and they're, apparently they're anchored in Atlantic City. Uh, well, they were little Buddhas on here. You got some Chinese figures. They're playing, you know, the one guy's just writing, the other guy's just playing. You would buy this, right? Yeah, totally. Next one. Tax Shindo. Who knows who he is? No, no, no. Miss Navarro's and the two ladies over here. Would you buy this record? And this is the refro. This is, I couldn't find a cover nice enough to do this. And then after this, he went on to make a few records like Bamboo and Brass, where he would do these sort of conventional, you know, big band type records, but would incorporate Japanese instrumentation. He made a record with Rod McEwen of all. Excellent. Gene Rains, he's kind of the king of the other guys. Yeah, there's actually a great reissue of his that was produced by our friend Marty Lush. And his they records are very expensive. Yeah, so, and even no, if you no, can find the CD. Mr. Varro, do not tell me you found them for 50 cents, please. Next one. Oh, that's the budget one taken from the other two records. That's the one that I can afford. All right. Pete Ruggolo. Who knows who he is? This is another guy that did all the music for television. And... Did, uh, uh, well, Stan Kent, Bridget Bardot, he yeah. did her records, right? Yeah, but the, the thing about Rugolo is he came, the next two guys are, are really people that came to us through Stan Kent. And the, the importance of Stan Kent can't be overstated because all the best studio right. musicians went through his bands. Plus, his instrumentation, he would use, he was using bass flutes before Mancini or anybody else and so forth. And. He also wrote the theme to Leave It to Beaver. So this is another moment where I bought a DVD box set of a show called Thriller, which was kind of like a Twilight Zone uh, hosted by Boris Carlo. And it's fantastic. There's an episode of Lord Saul, and it's, it's a great, if you find it, fine. So I'm watching this one episode while I'm working, and this happens. What do I do? I call Skip, right? <laughs> I, and I hold the phone to the television. This one I play for Ottawa. You like this one? Anybody know who the actor is? His name's John Ireland. He was pretty famous back in the day. And the story behind this is. They're a band in Free Castro, Cuba, and they're playing these casinos, and they're very popular, and then he loses it. He just, he, he gets writer's block. And so one of his band members joins a call, and he follows them, and they're playing drums. And he writes a song based on the drums, and then the cult leader comes and threatens to kill him when he plays the song again. So he kills the cult leader. As yes. And then later on, is, the song is so popular, he has to play it again, so he plays it and then he drops dead in the band And as you'll notice, there's a lot of very grassy, stand you know, 
Do you see him there? He's losing it, right? He's like, uh. Yeah, that's the call. Yeah, this is a good song. Yeah. This is amazing stuff. Oh, go back. Go back one. Go back one. Who has this record? You don't have this record? Oh, we have one that you don't have. I actually broke this record the other day. I was carrying it, and it fell, and it went straight down and crashed. But it's only like a $50 record. And again, Johnny Richards, also from the Kenton organization in the 50s, and there's a lot of... Uh, Do we not have this? Yeah. Next slide. Oh, okay. Yay! All right, this is Robert Drasnan. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Drasnan. <laughs> Very near and dear to speak hard, so I'm gonna let him pontificate for a while on this. Yeah, Robert Drasnan was, um, this album was kind of like the, 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 the crown jewel of the budget label, Exotica Records. It was recorded for a label called Tops. Tops was so low budget, they didn't even sell the records in record stores. You could buy them in like furniture stores or appliance stores. And it was run by a guy named Dave Pell. And Dave Pell's specialty at that time was to um, do sound the likes of Big Man. The, the big hits of Artie Shaw, the big hits of Glenn Miller, and a lot of their musicians had ended up here. So featuring members of the Artie Shaw band. And one of the guys working in the warehouse Tops Records at that time, which was in the same building as Crown Records at that time, as a matter of fact, uh, was uh, a music student named Robert Dresden. And uh, you might recognize this. This is called Chant of the Moon. And uh, he's just an utterly elegant, brilliant, incredible composer, as good as any of them ever were, including those who we shall not name. This was the last of the voodoos. Uh, he died before it was finished. I had to finish it for him. And if you ever have to finish your dead best friend's work, uh, it's not an easy thing to do. It was maybe the most, it was like he left me my final exam because he was very much a mentor. Tell them one of the songs ended up. Oh, um, yeah, uh, one of the songs ended up in, um, in a movie called A Man Named Otto which is not a documentary about Tiki Oasis, but rather a recent Tom Hanks movie. And um, you know, this should just tell you how gracious the entire Dresden family was, and Lee for that matter. I just said, just, just pay me for the hours I put in, you know, like as one of the musicians, I don't need any, what we call the back end, which is a residual payment. And a song from this gets picked up, and all of a sudden I find myself four figures richer without having ended up with anything. And I'm sure Lee had something to do with that. Um, but moreover, Lee Joseph, who frankly, a lot of the reason a lot of this music is cared about is all is because he was shouting at people until they cared. Lee is one of the unsung heroes of Kiki Exotica. That, you know, there's about six or seven people you can say this wouldn't be happening without, and he's one of them. Yeah, it's true. I'm not just saying that because you've my best friends, but. I am. Um, he was also the first person who like took it on faith that I could produce a record, so that was nice. But uh, Dresden got to, we, we got to present him at Tiki Oasis. I forget what year it was, but it was, um, it was great because for one, I actually got to play this music that I loved so much, and I had produced two, and uh, he was still alive at this time, so we weren't up to three of them. It was in seven? Okay. Um, but not only was it like the experience of getting to play the music, but he was an absolutely fantastic conductor, and that was great. And I got to see him almost in tears, seeing, you know, he was a real California guy, and he got to see people in California loving his music. And the, kind of the trademark for him is mallet percussion and female vocals. So when I put my group together, Voodoo Five, a lot of it is mallet percussion played by our friend Marty Lush, Mark Riddle. And this wonderful, Belina, will you please stand up? Like the greatest vocalist in the world. 
with Lawrence Wolf's steel guitar on the bandstand. You we have these records in the back, we'll have them at the show and we'll have them at the sweet party. Tonight. Yeah, so please come see us tonight, but I just want you to know, like, before we go any further, we always we always associate these four or five big names with Exotic. Go, oh, these are the guys, and that must be what Exotic is. But because it was commercial, just like with rock and roll, when it came out into the world, it took on a different life with each different practitioner. Robert Drazen's music is beautiful and wonderful and bears no relationship to Elizabeth Waldo's music, which is beautiful and wonderful, which bears no relationship to Cal Jader's music, which is beautiful and wonderful. But it's all there. It's all pretty reasonably priced. I mean, if you're trying to, it's a lot cheaper than collecting the Beatles, frankly. Um, and you can take chances with it because there are just certain, uh, let's call them graphic key terms on the album covers. So just, we're gonna make a list of those. Yeah, they'll be available at a popular, even Canadian price. But again, just go to the thrift store and just kind of go like, I don't know, what the hell, $2? So who, you will find something. Who was that Mike Thurman seminar? Do we have hands? So you, do you, you remember, before I started, I did a little presentation on Otto and drinking coffee, and, and I impersonated Otto. Remember that? Well, because of that, I had to show out of my PowerPoint this year, twice. <laughs> and he made suggestions on some records that he wanted us to talk about. So we're putting them, our boss's suggestions, we're gonna blaze through these. I have this record, I haven't listened to it yet. Shelly Mann. Shelly Mann is the most preeminent jazz drummer of Los Angeles in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. On TV, he's the Yeah, he's winners. everywhere. And his last ever recording was unfortunately on Barry Manilow's Paradise Cafe 3 and a album. So, and he's the Mighty Yeah. Next, next slide. Who has this record? You should. It says Savage, it says Drones. It says Africa, it has that weird font. And it's on the Tempo label, which is a weird label. Who has this one? I do, yes. And Sabu so is one of the percussionists on the Art Blakey album that we played for Alexa. Look at that one. Monty Moya, I don't have this one. And 35 millimeter. Anything that points to any kind of extra special phi, even greater than high. Tito Puente. Yeah. Yeah. Being from New York, Tito Puente, it's like, I, I heard that music in the womb. Yeah, and this again, this album is a, is a really percussion oriented one. You got the guy in the back with the voodoo head on. And it says Savage. You know, and, and if you can find that one in stereo, it's hard to find, it sounds amazing. I don't have this one either. Oh, uh, well, I would definitely buy this. The guy's sitting on the fire. Well, also, it's it's on Allegre, which is uh, one of the great Latin labels of New York. Conjunto. Conjunto. Next one. All right, so if you're into Exotica, Skip and I are actually starting an Exotica journal. which should be published in uh, the winter. We're interviewing people who are involved in Exotica music and strange and unusual music. And in fact, some of the heavy hitters from back in the day, we hope will be published in the winter. When we have enough interviews, it will be inconsistently published. It'll be published when we have enough material. But that's also fine because, you know, we're inconsistently motivated. And we named it Kizos, <laughs> and who besides Mr. Marl knows what that means? Maybe, perhaps, maybe. It's a famous song by Doris Day cover of a uh, famous Cuban song. Next slide. Thank you to Dad Hud. Yeah. Uh, 5211 tonight. You get to see Luca. Yeah.